Dr. Johannes, welcome to the SAT Studios. Good to have you here. Thank Good you. Good to have you back. And uh, I just want to start off and ask, first of all, that you explain to the, to the listening audience where you come from uh, and your vested interest in this topic, because we are asking the questions, why and how should I read the Old Testament? Uh, and maybe you want to start by telling us why you are passionate about the Old Testament. I remember that as a, as a kid of about 12 years old, I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus, as we would say at that time. And uh, when I told my parents about this, my mom, she was surprised because I didn't, you know, haven't committed too many murders or bank robberies or <laughs> things like that before. <laughs> but the one difference that, that, that was in my life was the love for the Bible. So, mm -hmm. so there's something that happened there that I could spend a lot of time, even as a kid, with the Bible. So maybe let's say uh, it started, so I told you that I came to faith as a child mm -hmm. and that my parents were Christian but also that from an early age there was this love for the Bible. And I remember my dad was a pastor as well, so there was a Greek New Testament. So I tried, especially in high school, you know a little bit about the Greek from your natural science studies, Alpha and Beta. So I tried to figure it out with a dictionary. But at, at varsity, obviously, one had the opportunity. So I studied Greek and Hebrew, and for some reason, the uh, more attention eventually went to Hebrew. Uh, I had the privilege to visit Israel during the student days with a, with a music group, and I just knew I wanted to be back. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, eventually, let me, I think I, I brought this book to tell you that story, and that will answer one of your other questions. We were almost done with our theological studies when my Hebrew studies professor invited someone from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. To, to conduct a lesson, and he had a copy of this Bible. So this is the Mikroot Gedolot. So this is one of the earliest books that were printed um, 500 years back. And it has the, if our readers can, uh, listeners can see there, it has the Hebrew Bible in the middle, but then also medieval commentaries there. So uh, I'll, I'll come back to this when we explain, but somehow I think God just uh, opened my eyes to the beauty of the Bible, of the Old Testament, of Hebrew as a language, of Jewish understanding of the Bible, and that is what brought me here. That is, that is, that is fascinating. How popular do you think is the, especially the Old Testament amongst Christians today? I think there's a generation that doesn't know who's Abram or Jacob David. or David or yes. where, where they would <laughs> fit. So it's actually shocking. So I guess the, uh, the, the Old Testament might not make it to the top 10, you know, the most popular mm. books Christians read. And they might develop a theology. I only study about Jesus. I love Jesus, so Old Testament. So I hope there are people who read it, and I know some who do. But maybe underlying your question is, is this assumption that it is not read and understood and loved as it should be. Yeah, why, why do we feel in a church setting that it's important to look into the Old Testament? Yeah, I'd love to say it was Jesus' Bible. So, mm, so, yeah, we're we're <laughs> so uh, yeah, and because it's just such, such a fascinating collection of books. Mm. It is, um, you know, these love stories, there's curriculum for training kids, there are complaints, there are prayers. There Betrayals. Are, uh, and you have all of it. So, yeah. so it is fascinating, and I think it's just a, a lame excuse to say I don't understand it or it doesn't appeal to me. It's God's Word. It had been that through all ages. And I think we need to discipline ourselves. And when we get to understand and we grow in, uh, I think we'll be hooked as I was. And, and, and I think it's meant for all of us. Yeah, and I, I want to ask you this because a lot of times when I look at the Old Testament, it seems like in some of my friends' Bibles, there are more books in the Old Testament than in my Bible. And uh, that's, that is quite fascinating. But have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Do you know about that? <laughs> I mean, you're interested in the Old Testament, but I spoke to some of my friends and then they asked me about these, these books and I've, it's not found in my uh, Old Testament. And, and maybe you just want to comment on that. Why is there, does there seem to be more books in some of, uh, some of the Christians' Bibles and, and not in our Bibles? Okay, so let's start with terminology. If you say Old Testament, obviously there's a New Testament. So it's not the name Jews would give mm. to their Bible. They talk, talk, talk about the Tanakh, so w which uh, we'll, we'll, we can get into that. But so it's the Hebrew Bible for them, and it has the 39 books. They cluster and arrange them differently, but it's the same 
what we call 39 books. Uh, and, but in the uh, Greek translation of the same, they had in the time of Jesus extra books, mm. uh, which we would call deuterocanonical books, and seven of those have been included in many of the Greek translations in the time of Jesus, and your Orthodox churches would retain them mm. as part of the Old Testament. So uh, adding the seven to the 66 we have, so a Catholic Bible would have 73 books, which would include the seven books um, added to the Old Testament, but they also have certain addition, um, extra parts to books like Esther and Daniel. So th the Bible is different for the simple reason that in the New Testament times, there had been Greek translations that included books that are not part of the Protestant canon. Mm -hmm. So you speak of many libraries, plural, in the Old Testament, which is there. Is that what you mean when you speak about mini library or different So if, if you take 39 books, that's, that's what I mean, a mini library. Sure. And, and they're different, so different mm. books. Mm. So, but also the plural that depending whether you speak to a Jewish person or to a Protestant believer or a Catholic or Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, they, their libraries would be a bit different, yes. sorted in a different way mm. and also with different numbers of books but with different names. So it's, it's good to understand where that comes from. Which part of the Old Testament is the most popular and why? Well, I know this is a, a bit of a loaded question because if somebody asks me which, which Old Testament book or is, is your favorite, it's, it's the hardest thing to do because I love Isaiah, I like Proverbs, I like Psalms, but, but it seems that there are certain books that are a little bit more popular. Uh, nobody knows the book of Obadiah, but everybody reads Isaiah. Mm. So what are some of those books and why? Or what's the reason? I hope you're right that everyone reads Isaiah because it's got 66 chapters and maybe, <laughs> it's, <yeah. laughs> maybe it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a hard read for some. Yeah. Um, um, I would say uh, Psalms and Genesis. Uh, so uh, let's start with children's Bibles because they obviously uh, pick the parts that, that they felt would be easy to communicate yes. with children. So no one would miss Adam and the garden, no one would miss the Tower of Babel or, yes. or Abram or so. So the, the Genesis, because these are family stories mm. and it's about the beginning, so it's so a very popular book. And then Samuel, David, uh, the, the, the early kings, uh, so, so those history, but history that have stories that people can relate to. Uh, you mentioned Isaiah, the prophetic literature. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's challenging, but um, since it's so important in the New Testament, so often quoted, I think that's another reason. Psalms, I think statistically, would be the most popular book in the Old Testament because the, the, the prayers, the Psalms are timeless. They appeal to people. We know many of those Psalms uh, by heart. Uh, some sing it. So, yeah, these are some of the choicest parts of the Old Testament. That's, what, that's great. There are also some books in the Old Testament which is actually very hard. Um, I can remember when I first read the book of Obadiah, I had no clue what it, mm. was, it was about. And I really had to go study to find the whole depiction mm. of the Edomites and whatever is happening in the internal structure of the book. But also Ecclesiastes, mm. when you read it in a way, it's almost like, what? This does not make sense. What are some examples of other Old Testament books which, is, which might be a little bit hard to read and, and why should we read them? <laughs> I'd like to have you as an examiner because you ask your questions in such a way then you start to answer them for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, we could um, have that arrangement that next time I, I come for exam that you would help me. Uh, yes, let's start with, with Ecclesiastes. It, it is a book that in terms of just the tone, so mm. it is this uh, pessimistic look at life yes. and uh, lamentations, uh, just this mourning, this, this complaint about uh, just the pain of, of the, the destruction of Jerusalem, mm. of exile. So maybe when we in that situation where, where life has lost its appeal, where things just there's no beauty left, there's no joy, that we might feel in a season of our lives that now I understand what Ecclesiastes is about. It, it gives voice, it gives words to things that live in my heart. Also psalms of, of complaint, of mm -hmm. lament, of pain, of calling for justice, of saying, um, and Job saying, God, are you there? Mm. Is there someone higher than you that I can appeal to because <laughs> you're not fair to me. I want to have an appeal court above you. Yes. So 
it, when we really suffer, uh, the Bible provides language, provides content and, and terminology that we can use to express. So you, your question was, uh, what are the other more difficult portions? Uh, people also struggle with the stories of, of, of God's vengeance yes, and, and, yeah. and especially where it seems like God is, is, is cruel. People would say, can this be the father of Jesus? Can be the, this the, the God who loves us all? Especially when you don't understand those narratives in their context. So yeah, yes, sure. there are portions of the Old Testament that maybe people would not use as a first reader. Maybe we can do a session in future looking at some of those problematic passages in the Old Testament. Mm. And I know uh, the author Paul Copan actually mm. wrote a wonderful book on it, but still it's hard. It's a hard thing to navigate, mm. especially when you witness to people. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of people that say, you know, when we read the, the Old Testament, and especially when we read Moses, he writes about his own death. And it could not have been Moses that wrote this book. And, 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 and so with the Old Testament, it seems like there's more than one author uh, how many authors wrote the Old Testament? Do we know? No, we don't know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we come from a time where you know the author, the author would tell everyone mm. and they would launch the book and there would be all sorts of nice things said about the author and you would get paid for that. It's a very foreign concept when we get to the ancient Near East. Mm. So. Uh, let's get to, to Moses. Uh, you talk about the, the last chapter of Deuteronomy that tells about his, his um, death. So we know that, uh, let, let me say this, do you know what is the, the oldest complete copy of the Old Testament that we have? No idea. And it was in the 10th or 11th century. Oh, is century. it the... Uh, yeah. um, the Lenin scrolls? Lenin gradensis. But um, so the Bible developed over a millennium or more. So different authors, different mm -hmm. situations. And that's why we have it in different stages. It was translated in Greek later in other languages as well. And quite often, like many Psalms don't indicate any author, and some portions are like Song of Songs. Mm. Uh, the book is attributed to Solomon. Some would say that means he was the author, but many scholars would say it's simply honoring him as someone who must have known something about love. So uh, <laughs> maybe he wanted to <laughs> write something about it. The Bible says he's, he had about a thousand wives, so he should have known something there. But uh, it was a tradition that wisdom is acknowledged, is, is you taste it, you know that this is godly, this is good, yeah, sure. but you don't honor one individual. In Judaism, they had this idea that Ezra wrote a lot of books and the prophets, so, so there are traditions about who wrote which book. But often you would read a biblical book and there's no indication of authorship because yeah. it was not an issue. So it's our curiosity. We want to know who wrote it, who paid him and Absolutely. why. But it's, uh, these were irrelevant questions. And I think we need to honor ancient wisdom for what it is and not be so focused on the things that would be essential for modern publishing. What would your opinion be? I know Walter Bauer wrote a little bit about the anonym, un anonymity of the Old Testament mm. and how it does not really take away from the credibility of the book. And you said we've got mm. this obsession that we want to know and we, we want to know who wrote it so we can know if this book is accounted for. Mm. How, how do we know the Old Testament books that we have, that they are authoritative? How, how, why do we include them? Did we discover them because if they were in use or what happened? Why, how do we know? I would answer in two, from two perspectives. The one, it's a historical fact. Okay, that corroborate. Uh, the, the fact that we have the Bible uh, and the many factors that, that contributed to this, mm. there were some debates about which books, but uh, you know, it, it just so happened that the people of God, when they read all the writings that were available, when they heard all of those, they cherished some of it more than others. Yes. So in the New Testament, Paul didn't have a Bible that he could open. He had scrolls. Mm. And some of them made their way into our Bible. Some, some didn't because they were just written for other purposes. But over time, and this is the one point, the historical fact that uh, it just developed. And uh, so when you ask for a Bible these days, if it's a Protestant Bible, you get the 66 books in a certain order, and that's your Bible. Mm. And let's accept the historical fact 
But from another perspective, as Christians, we believe God was involved in this. He guided the process. He led people to write, to curate, to transfer, to transmit, to translate, mm -hmm. to interpret. And we get some portions of the Bible quoting other portions and giving it new light. So it is a fascinating journey of God leading people to just hear his word, to write it down, to bring it together. And, and it's a mystery. If, if I say the Old Testament, the first complete Old Testament is just over a thousand years old. Oh, wow. But Moses goes back three times that. Um, yes. so, so that means there's a long period that we don't have evidence or publishing houses or know where it comes from. But this gives to me just this awe, this mystery of mm -hmm. just the beauty of God's word. And that when you read it, you know this is God speaking. God, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there any, anything about the Jewish people being an oral for make community? In other words, they used to tell story from one, sh one generation to the next. And, and in that way, sort of, they kept these stories in check and then they compiled them. I is there some credence to that or is it? Definitely. Uh, oral wisdom is a, is a reality of our own time. It's not only b biblical time. So, so there's certain things that, that are transmitted uh, by word of mouth. And in a modern era, we may be skeptical about this. Yeah. We may say, but it's changed. But if you go to oral cultures, they would give you, and you can test it in different portions That's where different yeah. dialects, different clans would live. And you could compare those and to find the reliability of, of oral tradition. So certain things were memorized and, and the rabbis used to teach kids to memorize Torah. the entire Torah. Exactly. And, and, and in, in Islam you would have kids uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, reciting the, the entire Quran. Quran. Yes. So, so it is within the human capacity to, do so. to memorize enormous amounts of material and accurately do that. So definitely uh, before printing presses and, and parchments and, and writing um, skills, people had this and they could hear it and they could correct it and pass it on. Yeah, I, I think the correct word, I, I heard one day, I think I read it in the Westminster Catechism of Faith. Um, I read through it, it's not because I'm a Calvinist, but the, the right word is autopistic. Also mm. the fact that the divine hand of God was, was initially in this book to guide whatever needed to come mm. out of it. And there's a beautiful depiction of this in the book of Jeremiah where the scrolls are mm. lost and they, then God goes and he, he takes it upon himself to restore this and he re-instructs. Mm. It's just incredible that God mm. would preserve his word like that. Mm. You mentioned something about Jesus read the Old Testament and I think that's a serious point that we really need to look at because what does it mean when you say this was Jesus' Bible? Yeah. So we obviously know it wasn't a printed book. Mm. Books came much mm. later, first um, parchments, scrolls, and then codex, and then later they, they had them put together into what mm. we might call the earliest parts of books. But books are, are fairly recent in terms of our, our history. But uh, Jesus was instructed uh, in the contents of the Torah, and he quotes the Psalms, he quotes Isaiah. So he must have heard. So not owned a Bible that he could read, but um, as, as a Jewish boy in Nazareth, we can assume that Jesus was instructed and maybe had to memorize um, mm. portions of the Bible. Paul um, studied that. We know it. Paul uh, was, was a Pharisee, so they studied not only the Bible, the Torah, but also the interpretation of it and authoritative traditions on it. So. Uh, uh, when Jesus quotes the Old Testament, he quotes. Uh, when Satan tempts him, three times quoting from the Bible, yes. Jesus answers him quoting from Scripture. When Jesus uh, preaches in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard that it was said, and then he quotes the Old Testament, yeah. oh. and then he doesn't criticize the Old Testament, he criticizes a shallow, superficial interpretation and application mm -hmm. of that Old Testament. So. Uh, Jesus knew what we call the Old Testament as separate books. He quoted, interpreted, and gave us guidance in how to this must be understood. And then uh, in, in um, John 7, uh, um, Jesus also says that uh, the, the scriptures, he spoke to the Pharisees, and mm. he says, you study them, 
it talks about me. But the scriptures speak about me. So, yes. so Jesus was aware that there was an anticipation in the Old Testament, and he explained that, that it pointed forward to the coming Messiah, to the one who would reveal the Bible and its meaning in its fullest sense. You mentioned about Jesus that, that, that looked at the Old Testament as his Bible, but mm. just the other day I was actually going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Synoptics uh, first, and it struck me just so many at times how many at times the, the disciples of Jesus referred to the Old Testament and leaned on it to, to make it known that Jesus was the actual fulfillment of that. So the Old Testament was Christ's Bible, but for the disciples as well, it was their Bible as well. Thanks for the question, Rudolf. You, you referred to Matthew. The, the question of that time was, who is the Messiah? Yes. So it was the, the climax of Roman oppression. And within decades from that, the Romans came and destroyed everything mm. that was there. So it was a, a season of heightened messianic expectation. So yes. the question, um, the Old Testament does tell us about someone who would come. The prophets anticipated the, com the coming of the one, of the Messiah. So, and different pictures there. So their question was, when would the Messiah come? How would we know him? When would he come? So, so heightened messianic expectation. And in that setting, the Gospels were written, and especially Matthew that says, let me show you what was said by this, by that, by that. These are fulfilled in Jesus. And the story of Jesus is told from an Old Testament perspective mm. with Jesus as the fulfillment. So it's not only the Bible of Jesus, but it's also the Bible preparing people for understanding Jesus sure. and Jesus helping us to understand the mm. Bible as the true Word of God. You, you just spoke about different expectations and I, I always struggle with the idea that these religious people that had the law mm. struggled to, to see Jesus for who He was. Is it because there were varied ideas or was there basically a similar understanding and that's why they missed Jesus? Because some accepted Him, some Jews saw Him for who He was. But was there a plentitude of ideas that expected the messianic role to be a specific fulfillment or was it just one expectation that Jesus couldn't fulfill? Isn't it part of our human nature that we want things tangible, we want things we can understand mm. and we can control? Yes. So I think it's a real danger of theology, even in mm. our own time, that it becomes a science, it becomes something we study and we can quote all the relevant sources. So the Pharisees made that the industry. They yes. could quote, they could understand. And God was in the end optional in the religion. This is the danger. Mm. So there's a story in the Talmud that uh, has this debate among rabbis. And one of the rabbis who wanted, according to the Talmud now, who wanted to call on God to affirm his position. So it's a beautiful story. Mm. It's more detailed than what we can cover now. But when he called on God to, to answer, the other rabbi answered him and said, God had his turn. He had spoken in Scripture. Yes. It's now our turn. It's now for us. So the, mm. the, and you, you can't believe this, the position to say, we are now the custodians of theology and of revelation. God has spoken. And, and I think as, as back to this, the danger that God is optional and pushed aside, that we are the masters of our craft. We know the books. We know the concepts. We have a good theology. The question is, do we know God? Mm. Are we in relationship with Him? So, sure. And I think there's a danger for all of us that we become so at home on the pulpit and in preaching and in doing our ministry that we lose this contact, this, um, um, just this focus on God Himself. So I think what we see wrong in the Pharisees is a timeless temptation and danger that if it's, if it's about a religion or a science, God becomes optional and that's dangerous. No, you're right. And for a lot of people reading the Old Testament, they will say, well, that's exactly that pharisaical spirit that mm. we should avoid and therefore mm. do not mm. read too much of the Old Testament. Because look at all of these laws. The Levitical law tells us that you shouldn't, you know, wave your garment in a specific way. You shouldn't eat with your neighbor that is of a different persuasion. And, and uh, how, how do we deal with those things that we see in the Old Testament? Are those things 
things that we should still uphold or you know uh, I know some of our friends even say you should go to church on Saturday because that's the Sabbath and I go but we go, we go Sunday but what should we do about all of these laws should we still uphold them how do we deal with them when we read the Old Testament Let's say we, sh we need to understand them first because mm. it's easy to criticize something at a distance so that you don't understand. Yeah, for sure. Let's acknowledge the Old Testament is, is primarily about God's relationship with one nation. Mm. Yes, it and it has rules within that one relationship. We know this. So, and these had regulations for how festivals, sacrifices, pilgrimages, how these things had to be done, but all, then also how to eat, what to wear, and guidance for everyday things. So Jesus told us that every part of the Old Testament remains valid, but he also pointed us to the deeper intention of that. And let's go to the words of Jesus. He said that adultery w could be understood as something just in the extreme, something visible, something public, but Jesus said it sits in your heart. So Jesus consistently took us to God's intention behind those rituals. So and I think that is where we should find our point of connection. Mm -hmm. So whether it's food, whether it's how we dress, whether it's how we pray, it is about a relationship with God. And if that is cultivated, then Jesus brought us freedom. Also, the, the vision that, that uh, Peter had of the sheet lowered where God mm -hmm told him, um, you may eat, and he complained as an observant Jew. And then God gave him a new perspective that God can declare things holy or not. So my own position, and I think that's, a, that's a, an evangelical position, is that we no longer do those to deserve our salvation, even if that was God's intention initially. Mm -hmm. I don't think that is what was expected of the Jews anyway, but um, definitely not for us. But we can study those and understand God's compassion, God's concern, and the reasons why He wanted His people to be different. There are timeless um, um, applications and relevance out of those, but we need to understand it in context and, and not just take one piece and, and try to apply it. Yeah. It's meant for us. It does speak to us um, across different time zones, different cultures. There's beauty, there's relevance, but we need time to hear that. I always felt that the Old Testament law in actual fact shows me how I can't live up to the righteous standards of God. And uh, when I look at the Old Testament, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I was born in South Africa, <laughs> <laughs> you know, later than, than the Jewish people. But, but isn't that maybe the intention also is to show Israel, you can't do this, you need me. You know, you can't lean upon the law you need the lawgiver. Isn't there maybe an intention like that in the Old Testament? Yeah, but the command to love God is in the Old Testament. Yeah, for sure. The command to love your neighbor as you love yourself is in the yeah, Old Testament. Yes. So we should not see this as there was impossible commandments then. Uh, God wanted people to love him. Even the prophet said, God is not interested in your sacrifice. Yes. So oh. because, and, and the point is, you don't pay for your debt by just the blood of animals, mm. but you demonstrate that that you're a broken person, you demonstrate that you understand your sin, that you con confess it. So there's, there's mercy in the Old Testament, there's a call to love God in the Old Testament as you would have in the New Testament. Oh, that is amazing. Thank God for that. John Calvin was probably, uh, well, I think when I read through, through his, his uh, volumes, he, he mentions a word called the manus truplex Christi. And I think when you read the Old Testament, you always see that God works all through the prophets or through the mm -hmm. kings or he works, uh, you know, through, through the priests. And um, what is the meaning of that in the Old Testament? And why should we look out for it and, and note it and take note of that very concept? So uh, you say that the Old Testament deals a lot with leaders mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you highlight the three functions of uh, prophet, king, and priest. Uh, there's something beautiful in those, but let me first say these are not the only leaders. Mm. You have old elders, you have judges, yes. you have heads of families. So, so it is more complex than that. So it's a reduction to, to have only those three. But let's, let's put the question this way. Can we learn, what can we learn from leadership in the Old Testament? Yes. So uh, let's just go to Deuteronomy 16 to 18, three chapters dealing with leadership specifically. Mm and just beautifully lumped together 
to, to address this issue of leadership. And let's go to kings. We may say we don't have kings anymore, but we do have political leaders. And they are very influential mm -hmm. and they decide world events and trends even as we speak now. So in that um, 10, 12 verses about the king, it is fascinating that the king should have a copy of the Torah. Mm. And the priest should give the king a copy of the Torah so that the king would know the revelation, the commandments of God and keep them. So isn't that beautiful that, I mean, this is a political leader. And in our own time, if we can, as prophets and as priests, hold the governors and the presidents accountable to justice, to truth, and they may not agree with the source where this comes from. Mm, mm. But this is God's word that there's no one above God. And this is a Christian belief. This is what we stand for to say yes. that we don't want to separate our politics and our faith. That w even if, if someone would be a mayor of a town or a governor of, of uh, the Reserve Bank or s uh, in, a, in a public office, we should have the copy of God's Torah because it applies to every sphere of, of human endeavor. Uh, my professor uh, passed on by now. He said, everyone wants to run to the prophets. They love the prophets. He said, you miss the priests who are the main ones. If you study what the mm. priests did in the Old Testament, they were responsible for music, for maintenance of the temple. They um, were there for the sacrifices. So um, pastors, um, we all want to be prophets, but actually it is the priestly functions that sure. we fulfill. So these are very important That's functions very in the Old Testament, yeah. and it's a priestly function. It's also in the New Testament quoted mm. to say that we are priests because we do intercession, we uh, listen to people, we minister to them, we share with them God's word, which is what the priests did in the Old Testament. Testament. That is fascinating. Uh, I will definitely look at it, the pastoral role in the church more through priestly eyes. I never, never thought of that. Just a question. When we look at Jesus, he, there is the assumption almost that he fulfills in those three functions, isn't it? In the New Testament, he becomes the Davidic king. Uh, he is obviously, you know, that prophet and obviously he's our, our priest. He's our intermediary, according to 1 Timothy 2. Uh, it, a lot of people say, therefore, you know, the old, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, there's no more need for kings and there's no more need for prophets and priests. And, and we acknowledge that. But, but there is something of the fulfillment of Christ in those three roles that we should take note of. Definitely. And um, again, you answer the question to some <laughs> degree. So thank you for that. <laughs> no, but uh, we do find those roles in Jesus. I think the question is what's left. Uh, how mm. does Jesus do that through us? And so he, he led by example certain things he did uniquely, but others he would want us to, he sent his apostles out to go and preach. He gave them authority to minister. Yes. Uh, and Christians have understood the uh, mandate to enter the world, the, the public space, and they would fulfill royal functions, they would fulfill prophetic functions, they mm. would ful fulfill priestly functions. Again, remember my observations, these are not the only leadership roles in the Old Testament. Yes, so yes. judges, elders, heads of families, these are also the functions and, and teachers, um, the instructors. They were priests in some cases, but some were elders. So we have more than three functions. And as Christians, we uh, the fact that Jesus fulfilled them should inspire us to, to allow him to do that through us. So leadership yeah. is key in our prophetic witness, in our being priests, and in our royal functions. Yeah, I like that. You uh, did in your doctoral studies, you, you looked specifically at the Jewish way of interpreting the text. Um, there's a lot of emphasis these days. I know a lot of people have written books, Jesus the Rabbi, let's read the Bible mm -hmm. through the eyes of Jesus the Rabbi. And some of it is good, some of it is, is, is weird. But what would you tell us quickly? I know you can't give us a whole description of your doctoral thesis, but, but is there some value in it? And, and what did you discover in your reading through, through that didactic? Thanks for that question. <coughs> I told you something about this. And let mm. me say that uh, two things, the, the, the one positive and the other one that, that persuaded me about the limits of the topic of your question. So 
I think it's very important to understand the context of the Bible. And I'm talking about geography, I'm talking about history, I'm talking about culture. So when you are privileged, as I was, to, to with my wife, spend a year in Israel, to drink that in so that uh, places mentioned, uh, they just call up mm. pictures because we've been there, you, you get a better understanding. And also of the Jewish people, fascinating people. Uh, it was a shock to me to find that the majority of the Jews in Israel are not religious. Mm. So when you go to Jerusalem or some of the bigger places, you would find a concentration of, of Orthodox Jews, but they are a minority. So, but just understanding the Jews as a people, making friends with them. So, uh, to me, that gave me a perspective, a deeper understanding, a context for, for reading God's Word. I referred to the fact that uh, um, the professor from Hebrew University opened this book to us. And it's the first time that the penny dropped in my heart that there are people who speak the language and understand what the language of the Old Testament and shouldn't we listen to them and engage with them as well. Yeah. So this book had from the Middle Ages from 10th to the 13th century Hebrew commentaries on the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and this professor could read this and explain it's like a conversation, a Hebrew conversation between those who, who wrote the Hebrew text and this is ancient and those who interpreted this oh in wow. the Middle Ages. So I was blown away and, and my question was, should I not go to them and ask them to, to explain to, to... And I learned a lot from Jewish exegetes and I did my thesis on a portion. So I analyzed a commentary in Hebrew on the Hebrew text, mm -hmm. in, in my case, uh, a text from Deuteronomy. I found limitations to this, just this awe, this fascination, fascination about everything Jewish. Because uh, uh, the idea of the dual Torah, so fundamental to Orthodox Judaism, is this belief that God gave the Torah in two channels or two shapes to Moses. He gave him parts of it that had to be written down. This became the Torah. Mm -hmm. But he also gave them the oral Torah, which is how it should be understood. Mm. And in Judaism, the belief is Orthodox Judaism. If you don't understand the written one, you follow the oral one. And mm. I'll give one example. Sure. Um, kosher laws are based on a verse in the Bible that says you shouldn't cook a kid or a calf in its mother's milk. Mm. And it's a, it's a mysterious verse. But the oral Torah says God gave the instruction not to mix blood and dairy. And then they built the entire kashrut, the rules of how to live kosher, on the oral understanding of what God meant with that verse. And so I realized that the traditional interpretation of the Bible that found its way into the Talmud, that is so strong in Judaism that very few Jewish scholars would help me only with understanding the Bible because they are so much bound into this oral Torah mm. that there's limits to what they could teach us. Also because they don't acknowledge Jesus as Messiah, obviously those would be the limits. So I'm saying two things. Uh, so I learned a lot posit in the positive sense of loving and understanding and getting the context, but I understood that Firstly, because many Jews are not believers, do not study the Bible, do not serve God. Um, that means they can't help me in following Jesus. Yes. And the other part is because of the adherence to the oral Torah and the fact that they reject G Jesus as Messiah, there are limits to what they could teach me. But I think we should hold on to both. Respect mm. uh, the people of Israel for who they are, people loved by God even today. Um, respect them for those who received and ha transmitted God's Word and also experts in interpreting the Bible because it's their language. Yes, they study right. this. They even study the New Testament but realize that there are limits to what they can teach us. What would you say to pastors that, that are very fascinated by Jesus being Jewish and, you know, you get some pastors, I know it sounds weird, but they will wear 
the, the Jewish carp, they'll have prayer shawls and there'll be an overemphasis of the Jewishness of Jesus to such an extent that they believe becoming more Christian is becoming more, Jews, uh, more Jewish because Jesus was Jewish. Uh, that's not what we mean when we say follow Jesus. Eh? We don't, we're not saying become more Jewish. It's something different, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a very huge movement mm. of, of moving back to the Hebrew Judaic, roots. E yeah. e Judaic or Hebra uh, Hebrew roots. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't want to judge people or criticize them. I think in the end we need to, to make our choices. What, what I found in Israel was the diversity that you would find Messianic believers, people who are from a Jewish background and who accept Jesus as Messiah. But they're as diverse and as uh, compartmentalized as we as, as other Christians are. So you would find them from completely orthodox to um, giving up all Hebrew identity and becoming like a, a Western person as well. So, so there's not one way to, to figure out to what extent do we need to accept the Hebrew culture. Let's just acknowledge that the culture people try to ad um, adopt for themselves mm -hmm. is 2,000 years away yeah, from exactly. Jesus. And in many cases includes stuff that we don't get from the Bible. Mm. Hanukkah was, wasn't there, uh, a lot of, of, of Jewish um, rituals. We don't, uh, you know, it's, it's in the New Testament times, but we don't have it in Scripture itself. itself. So it, there's a danger that this becomes a, a new fashion and people want to run. There's also a danger what we see in Messianic movements that at some point people bypass Jesus. Mm. That Jewish religion, Hebrew symbols, rituals yes. become so important, but that somehow they grow cold towards Jesus who actually inspired this. Oh. And this would be to me the sign that, that something is wrong. So let us understand Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah, mm. but let's not just uh, decide to to change everything and to make that a new religion. For some, this is where they want to go. Yeah, for sure. I explained that, that I found some limitations as to how far I should go. What would your practical advice be for the church and Christians to be more uh, involved in their devotions and also in pastors preaching and then also in their everyday Christian living when they look at the Old Testament? I would say read it. Mm. There's, no, there's no replacement for that. So uh, how can you talk about the Old Testament if you've not read it? And if I say read it, really spend time for it. So since as a kid, I told you I, when I met the Lord, there's been this hunger. And it's every day I start my day there. And I try to, to read one Old Testament book with attention and you know slowly trying to get to the bottom of it what I can. And then I would read a New Testament book and then I would go back to the Old Testament. So the wonderful resources that one could uh, consult and can use, but spend time with God and His Word, spend time with the Old Testament. And I would strongly urge everyone to read a book as a complete unit, mm. because if it's the Psalms, if it's Isaiah, if it's Deuteronomy, we need to read a book in its context and uh, portions in its right uh, place. Um, so read it, pray it, live it, and in that way uh, the Bible would not be a foreign entity, something that we talk about, but something that's really entering our lives that shapes who we are. Yeah, oh, that is wonderful. And uh, I've, well, we've with the seminary actually with you went through certain Old Testament aspects and it, it was just so enriching. Mm. Um, it almost felt like you've discovered another thing of the Bible. And I can remember one morning you mentioned something, and I was like, that's not in the Bible. And I went and I looked, and I was like, oh, it is. <laughs> you know, so, so the Old Testament is actually so rich mm -hmm. uh, in, in revealing who God is. And uh, it's, just, it's just such an incredible story that mm -hmm. you see unfolding. Thank you so much for being here. Maybe next time we should do a survey and we take it book by book <laughs> and we go through Genesis. Thanks, Rudolf. Right thank you so much for being here. Thank it's you. always a pleasure, and I hope we will get you back.